Okay, this is the second part of the uh, AMSCO Chapter 26 uh, Cold War, Early Cold War uh, Lecture. We ended with a overview um, of the Cold War as an imperial conflict between two empires, really two emerging empires, the United States being a bona fide empire from 1898 on, and the Soviet Union being a um, really a bona fide empire really from World War II on. Um, there's a couple failed attempts against Japan that that uh, don't work uh, the pre-revolution right for Russia um, but it's really the um, the Soviet acquisition of Eastern Europe uh, that kind of propels them into the Imperial um, into the Empire game okay so that's where last the la lecture uh, ended off part one was more of an ideological overview some of the big picture stuff and now I want to get into briefly some of the specific uh, policies uh, that uh, defined the early Cold War period. Um, obviously, um, you could the, the the beginning of the conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States, you could argue, right, begins at the Elba River when Russians and uh, um, Americans meet after they defeat uh, Germany, both invading the Russians, obviously, from the east, the Americans and other allied forces from the west. Um, that moment of uh, post-war unity was very brief. Um, and Germany is kind of one of the, the ground zero for a conflict between east and west, as it were. Um, as we learned about at the end of uh, period um, uh, seven, uh, uh, post-war Germany is divided between the event, the, the uh, allies, uh, the various allies. In the Yalta Conference in 1945, um, Stalin lets Roosevelt and the and uh, Churchill know that um, he doesn't want this to happen again, uh, and he sees Eastern Europe as a potential buffer zone. Uh, between Russia and Germany, where again, um, this has happened twice, right? World War One, and then World War Two. Um, so instead of as the French built the Maginot Line, um, and it failed miserably, um, the Soviets want Eastern Europe to be their buffer, um, their line of defense between them and the Germans, just in case the Germans get, um, you know, act up again. Um, so that is in direct conflict with what uh, the other allies want. The other allies, of course, want these nations to be free um, and they want democratic elections and they want free markets, right? They want these countries to participate in a capitalist free market economy um, because they think genuinely think that that is the best economic system and also um, selfishly. Um, it will help their own economies, right? That these the the the, the post-war world is one, at least from a um, capitalist perspective, is one of increasing cooperation um, and and trade and borderlessness, uh, and we really see this beginning um, as early as right Yalta, right? The, the 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 West wanting one thing and the Soviets wanting another. Um, obviously, caught in the literal middle here is the actual countries themselves. Um, they also want self-determination. They want democratic elections. That doesn't always mean they're going to vote for someone who is um, in the mode of England or the United States. A lot of these countries um, suffered under fascism um, and have a real uh, fear of anything kind of uh, uh, right-wing nationalist um, uh, etc. So a lot of them also want to be socialist countries, but they want to be independent countries, right? They don't want to be either puppets of the West or puppets of the East, as it were. Um, turns out they don't get that. Um, so 1945, uh, Roosevelt dies, Truman becomes president. Um, remember, why is Truman the vice president? Henry Wallace is not on the ticket. They get rid of Henry Wallace because he's too radical. He's even further left than Roosevelt. They think we need a moderate Democrat on the ticket to get Roosevelt elected. It happens, and then Roosevelt dies pretty quickly thereafter. Um, the United Nations is founded, so this is the like, League of Nations redux. It actually works this time um, the, to, again, just like the League of Nations wanted to avoid another World War I and failed, 
uh, the United Nations wants to avoid another World War II and succeeds, right? They don't get a, you get a Cold War, but we don't get a hot war, as it were. Um, they, the United States is cuts off aid to USSR. It's a very brief period of during early, you know, 33 in Roosevelt's administration to when he dies, um, that there's um, a kind of detente or um, a political thawing of relations. That's off. Um, Poland, and Poland and Bulgaria uh, have pro-Soviet communist governments, and then Yugoslavia and Albania are independent communist governments. So not all, not all satellites are created equal. Um, some are more um, puppet-like, right, under the direct control of Stalin and the Soviet Union, and others are independent communist countries that are um, uh, closely aligned, right, with the Soviet Union, and that 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 is Yugoslavia and Albania. The famous Iron Curtain speech, uh, uh, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill gives it in 1946. Um, this term really sticks that there is a, you see here, obviously in the background, a iron curtain that divides Eastern Europe um, uh, uh, from the capitalist West. Um, pictured here is George Keenan, the political chess master, I suppose. 1947, he writes a, an, uh, under the name Mr. X, because he's actually in the administration, right? It would be a kind of big deal if he... Uh, Put his name on the article. He writes an article in Foreign Affairs that argues that um, the Soviets can be stopped without going to war. Um, oops, sorry. Um, the Soviets can be stopped without going to war. Um, and you go, yeah, of course. Well, we see this as obvious because we know the history of the Cold War. But at the time period, really the only model you have for major nations uh, increasing conflict between major nations is World War I and World War II. So the idea that somehow you can stop an aggressive and powerful nation, not through direct military means, but by this idea of containing their imperial spread is a kind of big deal. Um, and again, containment in various forms we'll see as the, um, the kind of North Star of at least the United States' approach to the Cold War, whether it's the Truman Doctrine or later on we'll see with flexible response with uh, John F. Kennedy um, or even as late as Reagan and what Reagan is doing with uh, the Soviets, it is all some form of containment. Um, and we'll look at, it is not always non, non-violent, right? There's a lot of conflict. It's just not direct conflict between the uh, Soviets and the Americans. Um, Truman Doctrine, aid countries um, uh, that are contending or fighting off um, communist forces. In particular, this is Greece and Turkey. Um, there is no better environment for um, encouraging not only um, communist kind of strong men to come to power, but genuine organic democratic interest in communism than making a country's economy very, very bad. Um, when there are many who are poor, um, uh, they're going to gravitate towards an ideology that says that poor people should have more rights and more money. Um, when there is dramatic wealth inequality, it's not to say there's not rich people in Greece and Turkey, there are. Um, but when you have that kind of dramatic wealth inequality, again, you have a, um, a fertile ground for communism. Truman sees this, and the idea is you aid these countries in fighting off um, the Soviet advances. Uh, the Soviets obviously are interested in Greece and Turkey because they want better access to the Mediterranean. Um, uh, if you think about where the Soviet Union is, they've got ports in the Far East, along the Pacific. They have ports in the Baltic um, uh, region, but they don't have good access to the Mediterranean, so they want to have more influence uh, and over countries that are on or, or near the Mediterranean. Um, Marshall Plan, uh, named for the Secretary of State at the time, economic and material aid to rebuild. Again, same thing, right? Um, we need to kickstart the economies of Europe to keep them in our, i.e. the American, sphere of influence and not have them fall to the Soviets. Um, so, um, and also to prevent an economic depression, right? Let's keep American industry going. Let's ship stuff from the United States to Europe. 
Um, and it's a lot of money. I mean, to think it's billions and billions of dollars that are being sent to um, Europe um, that's a really kind of incredible policy considering how kind of uh, the, the debates that happen in the United States in the 21st century over budgets and things like that, that, this, that the United States would give um, close to $17 billion to other countries, right, to help other countries' economies is kind of incredible. But it gives you a sense of how strong the economy was and a very different uh, time period it was as well. Berlin blockade. Um, again, the Soviets think that the West is being overly aggressive. They uh, blockade West Berlin. Um, what do you do? Do you capitulate? Do you invade? Uh, neither. You airlift in supplies, um, 20, 200,000 flights over the course of a year, and then the Soviets eventually do back off. Um, this is actually interesting. This here is an image from the AP exam last year, the 20... Um, 2019 exam that was kind of flummoxed students, right? That the, the, the milk was such a big deal. They think, well, we didn't learn about milk in APUSH, but you did. You learn about the Berlin blockade. And if you're smart enough to put one and two together, you see that this is, right, it's an ad for Douglas or McDonnell Douglas, an airplane manufacturer. Um, again, an airplane manufacturer that is located in the Sun Belt that it exists because of a New Deal or a, um, New Deal and wartime policies that that uh, help to fund the defense industry, um, and here they are now in the post-war world, um, dropping uh, glasses of milk on little children. Um, okay, 1949 is a big deal in this time period because one, the USSR detonates their atomic bomb, and then China, right, that the Chinese Revolution, which has been ongoing for a very very long time, kind of stops. They hit pause during World War II, and then it's back on after. Um, the communists win. Um, they take over all of mainland China, and then the nationalist uh, Kuomintang uh, retreat to Formosa, or what is now Taiwan. Um, and that continues right to, to this day, right, that kind of political setup. Um, so this, again, is a wake-up call. right? 1949, we are not, I mean, think about what has happened. World War II has ended in 45 and here we are we're not even out of the 1940s yet and we've already had um containment the truman doctrine the marshall plan the berlin blockade um uh, the division of germany all of the kind of elements that will come to define the cold war are set up um even before the 1950s right kind of incredible to think how fast this history is moving uh, in the course of less than five years um 1950, things really heat up. Here you see on the right a GIF of the um, North Korean and Chinese advances uh, in red, obviously, um, pushing down uh, the Korean Peninsula um, beginning in um, 1950. Wait, there's 1950. There they're pushing south, August, September, and then the Allies pushing back north all the way to the Yalu River, and then the Chinese pushing all the way back south again. Um, and you have this back and forth throughout the war. Um, and then the stalemate, in the end, they stop where they began. Um, oh, say, okay, so NATO is happening in Europe. Um, the, the Soviet Union responds with their version of NATO, which is the Warsaw Pact. That happens five or six years later on the other side of the Soviet Union. Um, you have Korea, which much like Germany is divided between um, part that is occupied by, um, uh, well, not the West, but pro-Western elements, and then the other part is occupied by uh, pro-communist elements. Um, both governments are puppet governments. Neither one is a real democracy, uh, even though the North claims they're a democracy. Obviously, that's a farce. Um, the South claims they're a democracy. That's also a farce. Syngman Rhee is a strong man um, who is propped up by the United States. He's very repressive over um, South Korean people. And then in the North, Kim Il-sung, a grandfather of Kim Jong-un, um, same family, right, is the, the puppet of uh, um, um, the Soviets and the Chinese. Um, Ri is not nice. Uh, he, there are various popular uprisings demanding more democracy. Um, that is perceived to be a call for communism right? Um, that uh, 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 more power to the people, again, 
there's there's this way in which right if, if you if you call for democracy too loudly you sound like a communist and that's exactly what re suggests um there's um a lot of instability in the south and the north sensing this it's a good time to invade they invade um and we get the Korean War, right? The book goes into it. Um, they eventually, the, the armistice is signed. The war is never really ends. The, the two Koreas are still officially at war. They're just like not shooting at each other. It's not a hot war. Um, the DMZ or demilitarized zone divides the two Koreas. Um, and obviously South Korea now is, I mean, it's a global right, superpower. It's come a very long way from 1950. Um, and meanwhile, North Korea is kind of almost gone back in time, you could say, right? Um, very, very economically isolated and, and poor. Um, this is just the, this is the first hot conflict of the Cold War. Um, and it is not the last, right? So in closing here, I will just go over very briefly um, a longer history of um, what these conflicts looked like. And keep in mind when we're looking at this one, that again, the Cold War is an imperial conflict between two empires, one capitalist, one communist, um, who both want to expand their economic spheres of influence. Um, and two, and when we look at these conflicts, think about how the Cold War conflict are rooted in the history of period seven. Um, the emerging empire of the United States Remember Kipling and the white man's burden. Um, come now to test your manhood through all the thankless years, cold, edged with dear bought wisdom, the judgment of your peers, um, right? Those peers being other European uh, imperial powers. So as we go through this, I'll kind of go over very quickly here. Iran in 1953, um, Mohammad Mozadek is elected um, through a regular, normal election. He is a socialist. He says, why is all of our oil wealth being funneled to the British. I'm going to nationalize the oil industry and keep the wealth here for uh, Iranians. He's overthrown by um, um, MI6 and the CIA. Um, and then Reza Shah Pahlavi is installed. He is a strong man. Um, in 1979, he is overthrown, right, by the um, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the Iranian revolution of 1979. So again, long history here. Algeria from 1954 to 62, right? The French are a colony um, or a colonizer. Um, and Algeria is one of their most precious kind of colonies. It's the closest to France and they fight like heck to, to keep it. Um, the Soviets back the Algerian freedom fighters. It makes sense to them. Um, and that is an ongoing conflict between, again, a Western power and the Soviets. Cuba, 1959. Um, since the Platt Amendment, right, think back period seven stuff here, um, Spanish-American War, um, the governments of Cuba have been effectively puppet governments of the United States. Um, Fulencio Batista is overthrown by socialists. And we have the Cuban Revolution. Congo, 1960. Um, democratically elected leader Patrice Lumumba is overthrown. Um, Belgium does not want to support this newly independent colony. Um, the the uh, Lumumba goes to the United States. The United States says, well, we're with Belgium on this. We're not going to support you either. Who does he turn to? The Soviets. Um, and when he does that, that's the kind of fatal error. Um, he is thanked for his efforts with um, being overthrown and assassinated. Um, um, and then uh, replaced by Mobutu, who is a very bad uh, dictator, um, anti-communist, but very, very bad, uh, bad guy. Uh, Korea, again, we talked about this already. Vietnam, um, the French try to retake the colony after World War II. Uh, the Vietnamese don't take too kindly uh, uh, to that. Um, they fight back. The French lose. The United States takes over. They lose. Um, Chile, 1973, same thing. Democratically elected Salvador Allende is a, um, he's, not even, he's not even a socialist, he's a Marxist. Um, and he is overthrown and a military government is put in place to, um, uh, to run the country. And then lastly, Afghanistan, which we are in some ways still reaping the benefits of that intervention. Um, the, the, a socialist is deposed, a more pro Moscow leader is put in place. The United States funnels money to uh, terrorist groups, the Mujahideen. 
Um, they beat the Soviets. Uh, they evolve into the Taliban, um, and, and you know, dot 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 to be continued on that one. Um, so the key here is that the one the Cold War, Cold War is not cold. There are a lot of hot conflicts, but they are proxy wars. They are wars where the Soviet Union is backing one side, the United States is backing another, um, and they're going at it. The second thing is that um, in a time period of anti-communism, um, even, de even democratically elected leaders like Mossadegh, um, like Lumumba, uh, like Salvador Allende, um, are seen as major threats to the United States because, again, containment. Um, so it's not just the Soviet Union pushing, pushing, pushing further and further out. It's even countries that democratically elect socialist or communist leaders are seen as, again, domino theory. One domino falls and then the rest fall. Um, so this is an, uh, an overview. Uh, that is all of chapter 26. Um, and, and we will talk about this more in class tomorrow or whenever.